In this video, we're going to take scan data, do cleanup inside of Art Engine to make it a fully tileable PBR material. We're going to start off with a rectangular baked data set at 2 meters by 1 meter. And with the magic of seam removal and some color matching, we're going to come up with a fully tileable 2 by 2 material. I was a little worried processing this one. I actually thought that I'd have to go and use the clone stamp tools to fix this thing up. But Art Engine actually handled the seam removal quite well on a structured pattern like this. All right, so here's the three reconstruction of the surface um, inside of 3D Zephyr. So you notice that it's more of a rectangular area. So I've thrown this into Maya and created the baking surface for that. So we're going to reproject that onto a rectangular surface. I've already gone ahead and baked these guys out. And um, so you see kind of the top half is missing. So what we're going to do inside of Art Engine is take the bottom half and kind of fill up the space and make a, a tileable version of itself. Um, because we're going to be moving the height data around, um, I'm only going to be using the albedo and the height, and then we're going to regenerate the normal map and ambient occlusion inside of Art Engine. So here we are inside of Art Engine. Just going to drag and drop those two maps in, quickly compose it. So now we're just working with the albedo and height as a single node. You'll notice that we have a clear seam along the side borders here. So what we're going to do first is use the free transform and transform the entire material um, 180. That way we can kind of fill up the top section there. And what we're going to try to do now is actually blend, um, obviously the flipped one with the right, with the original version. And I'm just going to use a basic shape to build mask that sits on the top half of the material blend. So this is something that I just really wanted to try out and do. Um, I'm not entirely sure how people normally will convert like an odd sized image like a rectangular scan data into a full square version. So I was going to wanted to give this thing a shot. So there we go. So we kind of blended the two of them together based off that shape. Um, so now we have scenes seams along the outer borders and we also have a seam like right in the middle where we did the the blend between the two materials so the thing about the seam removal algorithm is you, you kind of want to give it the best chance for success so what i'm doing here is i'm looking at the height map and i'm going to transform the top material up just enough so we have the transition line kind of sit right on the on the border edge there so now the AI will have some room to kind of like fill that in for us. So it's actually looking, it's almost looking seamless already. Um, so it's not going to have to do too much work to kind of fix that up. And of course, we're just going to go and check out the 3D viewport and change our, our primitive to plane so we can see what we're working on a bit better. Cool. So I think now what we can do is bring out the good old seam removal. And I'm going to lower the threshold a bit to 2 by 2 instead of the default 3 by 3. Again, that's just something that you're going to have to just play around with um, as you're kind of working with the seam removals. And what I'm doing here is, as these things compute, I sometimes just like to make my nodes further down the chain because I know I'm going to use a bunch of other stuff uh, further down the line. So we'll let that compute. There you go. Cool. So it does a pretty good job, just like straight out of the box. I'm looking at the before and after for the seam remove. Um, structural elements are usually pretty difficult, but because if you kind of move your things in a way that it kind of gives the best chance for success, um, it's going to work a lot better. So I'm just checking out the, the border areas where the concrete sits and looking at the before and after a bit, just to double check that things are working out well. For the most part, um, it does work quite well, so you'll see some of that stuff happening there. That one looked a little bit odd to me, but that was actually part of the original um, scan data. So if you're having some problems with this thing, you want to try to preserve some of the, the edging. Um, we can always use a mass paint node and then put this into the structure guide. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to kind of guide the AI, let it know that, hey, this part, I want to try to preserve as best as possible. 
So these transitions from the top and the bottom kind of want to have a little bit better um, seam removal placed over here. I'm just going to check the top. So the top's bleeding over. Um, I'm just going to pop that into the seam removal in the structure guide and then let it run again. So what I'm going to do later on down the chain here is I'm going to try and color match this to uh, Quixel Megascan. Uh, you'll notice that the albedo currently is quite yellow, so we're going to bring in some sample data and try to match um, to uh, Quixel's uh, Megascan data. So I'm just looking at the seam removal now with the structure guide. And it's, you know, I think the original was actually looking pretty good, but this one's looking a bit better, I think. So I kind of noticed that odd spot there. So if you're ever having problems with that, um, you'll notice um, I was actually pressing the new seed a few times. And that will actually generate just like a, another new seed of the seam removal, which actually worked a bit better. So I kind of got rid of that weird stepping section that was sitting in there. And I'm just setting up my output node for later use. Cool, so did another seam remove with a new seed and I'm just gonna recheck the edges and that's looking pretty cool. So the new seed is actually really, really useful. Uh, when I first started using the mutation and the seam removal, I never pressed new seed, but um, if it doesn't work the first time, just hit that thing a few times, recompute it. If it doesn't work again, just, just press it, press the new seed again. Um, and after a while, it just kind of like magically works. So I'm looking at the middle seam here. So because seam removal only works on the border edges, we're gonna actually offset the entire material 50% um, on the Y. That way we actually push that seam section on the top and bottom edges. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a seam remove again, except this time for the parameters, I'm gonna put zero for the X, and then we're gonna put a value in for the Y. So I'm gonna put a value of one just for now because it's a really, really small section that I want the seam to be removed. So don't forget that you can unlock the seam removal axes to kind of put individual values for the X and Y. And I'm just bringing out a mass paint node here because I know that I'm going to need to clean out some of the kind of garbage data that was originally in this later on. And there you go, that's pretty cool. So that's looking quite nice and I was checking out the overall map. So if I had to go and clone snap all this stuff, it'd probably take quite a while to kind of like figure it all out and kind of sort it out like a puzzle piece. But the, the seam removal stuff works fantastic on this. I was actually really surprised how well it worked. So now what I'm going to do is use the mass paint node and just paint in some areas where I want to kind of remove. And what I'm going to do with this is actually place the mass paint into the seam removals ignore section. And what that's going to do when the seam removal is run, it's going to essentially ignore those parts that are painted in in the calculation. So those parts are essentially just kind of going to be taken away um, after that's processed. Works very much like a content aware fill. Um, I do prefer using the ignore mask a little bit more because I feel like it kind of gives a, a better result as opposed to the content aware. So I'm just going to paint a little bit more here and let those things process. And that did the trick there. So kind of get rid of some of those um, errors that were repeating because originally we did just flip the original one. So you're gonna get some repetition in there. So I do recommend kind of going with the mass paint node with the ignore, kind of painting out some areas. Um, what I didn't do in this video was actually use the mutation revision, which what you can do after the seam removal is put a mutation revision and then spot revise certain areas. That way it doesn't look like it's repeating because we did use the same sample or we rotated it around, we should have probably used the mutation revision to kind of vary up some of the, the grass bits so you don't see that repetitiveness going on. But um, that's something that I did actually after the, the recording. So I'm just gonna check out the overall map. And you notice the seams are looking okay with the, with the height on the height map. There's still some odd areas, crooked areas over there, but 
we're just going to leave that for the time being and just checking it out in the inspector there in the viewport so I'm not really liking that little section there so if something's not really working out like that one line there I'm kind of looking at the before and after I think I was getting again a little bit confused of you know what was going on because we did offset a few things to, to merge them together um, so instead what I'm going to do now is, is actually just do another mass paint and place this in the structure guide so we don't have any kind of like crookedness uh, from the concrete sections that we're merging together so I'm just going to go ahead and paint those guys in and I think at this point I noticed hey I'm actually painting on the wrong seam removal node Yeah, so I'm kind of just checking it out. And what am I looking at? So these things happen, you know, especially when you have quite a few nodes going on. Uh, and I'm trying to do this as, as fast as I can. So I made quite a few mistakes going in there. But in the end, um, I think overall, to clean this one up, only took about half an hour. Um, most of that time was probably just computing time for the scene removal. So. I noticed, oh, okay, I'm supposed to use the offset one to paint on top of. So I'm just going to erase all this guy and then redraw and redraw the, the structure guide. So the idea I had behind this was really to like, you know, are you able to stitch together scans? Um, so because what I did in the beginning was I offsetted the original one on itself, what you need to do is do a seam removal and then offset the entire canvas again and then seam remove again on that as long as you're pushing the seams to the outer edge each time. Um, so I'm going to try probably a more you know, severe case next time. Um, also the pattern array accepts materials now, so what you can essentially do is input four different materials um, that are not completely different but the same type of material that have seams on them um, and then kind of do like a double seam removal on it to stitch sections together uh, if you're trying to get more of an area like more of like a 2x2 two two or 4x4 four four eventually so I'm kind of looking at the seam remove here again definitely a little bit weird looking so again um, so that part didn't really work out, so all I did was go and press a new seed a few times. Um, I don't think my mouse was recorded, unfortunately, during that time, but um, the new seed is located on the seam removal node on the right side. So here I am just bringing in my Megascan data, which I'm going to color match to the albedo, and also use uh, something called the roughness transfer. I'm going to try that out. And what that's going to do is going to try to match the roughness values from one map to the next. Um, I've never used that one, so this is the first time I've ever tried it out, so I just wanted to check it out. Alright, so we, we added the structure guide and hit new seed a few times, and there we go, we have a, a much better seam on the tops and bottoms, and just overall checking the entire map out again. So the next thing we need to do is, because we're only using the albedo and height, um, on my scene removal, I'm going to change the output type to bitmap, and that's going to expose the two nodes so I can kind of grab them and work with them. And what I'm going to use now is the normal generation, so I'm going to pop in my height map, and that's going to really quickly generate my normal map out of it. And then we're going to use the ambient occlusion generation from the height. And that's going to give me a really nice ambient occlusion map as well, too. And I'm going to just dial that down a little bit, too. So my scan wasn't, you know, 100% perfect. I wasn't using a tripod on this guy. I'm still kind of freehanding it for now until I get some new gear. Um, so you'll see kind of some splotchy areas in there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to color match my albedo, which is a little bit too yellow for my liking to this Quixel Mega Scan that I grabbed 
and it's going to put that into the target. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit execute. And this color match thing is just awesome. Like I love using this. Um, you know, it's pretty similar to the one in Photoshop, but the fact that I can use a node graph to quickly test things out and try different looks with color match, it's like awesome. It's super quick and check that out. That just kind of blew my mind as you know, how well that worked. And that's the original scan from the Quixel, Quixel guys. So it's just kind of matching the colors there. And that's done. So the color correction is pretty much done for that guy. And then we're going to move that up. And I'm just going to pop that into the reference generator node, let that compute. So that's the default settings. And then we're going to put this into the reference transfer. So what I have in the target is the roughness map for that piece of scan data. Um, again, this is the first time I'm trying it out. So I'm just going to let that compute and see what it comes up with. That's pretty cool. So it kind of like brought up the values to the target. Um, the thing that I didn't really like about it is my concrete section sections should have been rougher than the grass. Uh, if you're looking at the, the target data. Um, so it wasn't really quite understanding like how this thing was working. So I just tried to bump up the intensity, recompute it. Um, it didn't really do anything in that case. So I'm just kind of checking it out. I thought I'd try to flip my roughness to a gloss map and then trying the roughness transfer. But all in all, it, you know, I think I kind of left it. Um, I didn't really use it at the end, unfortunately. So that's kind of what it gave me. Again, you know, like roughness maps, like I'm super picky with my roughness maps. I normally will take probably twice as long as what I'm doing here to, to generate one. Um, I'll also overlay, you know, like a bunch of other grunge maps on top of the current data that I have. Um, I, I usually won't just use the albedo map to build a roughness map, um, but to get something out kind of quick and dirty, you know, it de definitely does work. So I'm just kind of checking these guys out you know, what it's actually doing. So still working on the roughness map. I'm just going to regenerate the roughness transfer node. And I'm just experimenting here. So I'm just trying to, you know, possibly invert it to a gloss map and plug that in and see what happens. Um, roughness maps, you know, usually are really particular to the surface and whoever is working on it. Um, you can really tell a cool story with a nice roughness map. Normally, I wouldn't just use the albedo map. I would overlay a lot of grunge maps and imperfection maps on top of uh, the base layer. Uh, but in this case, I'm just trying to whip out something quick and dirty here. So I'm using the levels node now to try to get something closer to the mega scan roughness. Uh, what I like to usually do is also invert the ambient occlusion map, use that as a mask so I can fill in a white value into my roughness map and that's going to give the implication of dust kind of like built up in the crevices so when light hits the surface the areas that are occluded are going to be less reflective so i'm just checking this thing out one more time before i export it out so i did go back and kind of clean this up a little bit more with content aware fill um, after the compose material like in between the compose and the output just to get rid of some extra sections there. All right, so here's the finished material inside of Marmoset tool bag. Um, so you can see that it's tiling quite well. So it's like super extreme tiling, but uh, just to kind of show you guys kind of what came out of it. If you're curious about how to use Art Engine, I posted a link below to my playlist of tutorials from how to use seam removal to mass paint to mutation and other features inside of the tool. Hope this gives you an insight of what our engine is capable of doing. Thanks.